Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Thursday Chatting with Troy. This is T-Roy Cooks. I appreciate you joining us. And today is a special day, all right? We've got a good friend of mine, a very good friend out in California. I'm sure many of you know him. Ballistic Barbecue. His real name is Greg, and I asked him if he would join me answering some of your viewer questions. So I hope you don't mind if Greg takes some of your questions and answers them instead of me. But I think it'll be fun. And uh, again, Ballistic Barbecue, hit the iCard up here. That'll take you to his channel if you're not already subbed, and I'd appreciate it if you would subscribe to him. That'd mean a lot to me, and I'm sure it'll mean a lot to Greg, too. But uh, if y'all have questions, ask them in the comments down below. I'll put them on my list for a future Thursday chat. If I mention any YouTubers, or if you have questions about any YouTubers I may mention, any products I may mention, the questions that I'm asking in this video, hit show more below the video. That'll open the description box. You can find everything in there that you need, okay? If you can't, let me know. <laughs> uh, I put quite an extensive list in there. But, again, let's get Greg involved here. I've asked him to talk a little, about, a little bit about the pit barrel cooker, which I really don't have any knowledge about because I don't own one. It, well, I do now, but uh, just got it this week, so that'll be coming up. Y'all stay tuned for that. But Greg's been cooking on one for quite a while. So, Greg, can you tell these fine folks what your experience is with the pit barrel cooker? Take it away, Greg. Hey guys, Greg here from Ballistic Barbecue, and today I am crashing Troy's Thursday chat. So I hope you guys are cool with this. Actually, a couple days ago, Troy and I were talking on the phone. I consider him a good buddy of mine, and he asked if I wouldn't mind uh, kind of helping him out answer some of these questions. So, without any further ado, I'm going to start off with a question he personally asked me to field. I guess. Uh, well, I don't guess, I know. Uh, very recent, one of his Thursday chat videos, someone asked him his opinion of the pit barrel cooker. And he answered the question, but it was more anecdotal. He, he does not own a pit barrel cooker, so he was giving his opinion on his observations and his knowledge of you know outdoor cooking. And I do own a pit barrel cooker. Uh, I've had it for quite some time, actually. I own the very first version and I now own the most recent version. So this is my opinion on being a user. It's an awesome cooker. It, uh, again, for the price, it's, you know, 299, 300 bucks. And I challenge you guys to find a cooker for that price that'll cook eight racks of ribs right off the bat with someone who has very little or no experience in outdoor cooking following the guidelines that they set and having amazing success. This uh, cooker, it, it's an amazing cooker and it's very, very simple. Um, the owner of the company, Noah Granville is his name, he put a lot of work into basically just getting everything dialed in just right. Um, it's got a very simple damper down at the bottom where the, uh, like the charcoal basket is with a set screw and you open it according to where you are cooking in relation to the altitude, then you tighten it down and you just set it there. That's where you keep it. Uh, there is no chimney or anything. The smoke leaves through holes that uh, rebar goes through. The rebar you're actually hanging your food from hooks. And when those uh, the rebar rods are through the holes, that is actually part of the calculations that Noah did. So what happens is, even though you're hanging the food, the food's pretty darn close to the charcoal basket, the, it, it's only getting enough air to keep the charcoal burning at a nice kind of a delicate temperature, for lack of better terms. So you're, you're not drying out the food that's hanging close to the ribs. Now, I will say this. Um, my last pit barrel cook video that I did, I did a brisket. It was a pretty decent sized brisket, very long. And at the stage when the brisket was hanging from the hooks, the flat was a quarter of an inch away from the charcoal, which is fine. However, at the finished product, the brisket turned out really, really good. However, there's one little corner of that flat that was just a little dry. And in thinking about the cook and thinking about me doing a video while I was cooking, it kind of dawned on me there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes of these cooking videos that you guys don't see because we edit them out and with me it is usually 
my tongue gets tied or something and the words just don't come out the way they want I want them to come out they you know I don't articulate what I'm doing and so I do a retake and that was happening on that particular video it's driving me crazy but so I've got the lid off I'm screwing up I put the lid back on I cut the lid off and so ultimately what's happening is the fire is getting stoked down below and it just kind of threw it off whack for a while. I mean, I know that that charcoal just got way hotter than it normally would have been had I been just doing a cook without cameras on me. So my opinion of the pit barrel cooker is it's awesome. And whenever anybody asks me um, to suggest a cooker and there's a budgetary concern and they're not real uh, experienced cooker, outdoor cooker, I always suggest a pit barrel cooker. A, the thing runs itself. There's going to be very little, if no, frustration at all with this thing. And um, I, honestly, it, it's just a really, and it's a really good company. The owners of that company are just amazing people. So, this one is from, uh, this. I'm going off the list now, Richie Sakayamoto, and I probably butchered the heck out of that name. And I was suggesting that Troy and I answer this question. We both answer this question. And it's funny because when I first read this, I thought, oh, that's a cool question. That's an easy question. But the more I start thinking about it, it's a little bit more difficult than I initially thought. But what's your favorite American, or what's your favorite beer that's not American? And um, I love the craft beer movement that's going on in the United States right now. I think. Our beers are just right up there with the best beers in the world. And here in San Diego, you know, we've got breweries like uh, Ballast Point, like, like Stone, and these are world-class beers, so I love them. Um, that being said, love a good German beer. My father-in-law, who recently passed, well, a couple of years ago, he's from Bavaria, or was from Bavaria, and he was very fond of his German beers, so I shared a lot of really good German beers with him. But when I think about what the most common non-American beer that I drink, it would have to be Stella, Stella Artois. And um, for the sole reason is it's a very refreshing beer. So, you know, when I'm out on a hot summer day cooking outdoors, that beer is not filling me up and bogging me down. It's just a very crisp, refreshing beer. I also enjoy uh, Mexican beer, Modelo, and I love both the Negro and the Especial. I think they go great with uh, American barbecue, with your briskets, with your heavy, beefy cooks, and amazing with Mexican food. So that's more than one beer, I apologize, but I like beer. I'm passionate about my beer. Yeah, I like good German beer myself, and uh, Richie, that is a great question, man. For my own taste, uh, I'm, I don't drink coffee, so I don't really like the darker beers and the stouts and all that. I lean more towards the blonde color beers. I like a good Pilsner. Um, I'd say I like I like Dos Equis and Pacifico. Those are nice, refreshing beers when you're out on a hot day doing some barbecue. But probably one of my all-time favorites, it's a little expensive, a little pricey, it's a Belgian beer. It's called a Lambic Frambois. It's got raspberries in it. In fact, let me bust out the bottle and show you what it looks like so y'all pick this up if you can find it. All right, everybody, this is what I've got. This is one of my favorites right here. It's a Belgian. Again, it's a Lambic beer. And the yeast is still, it's a sediment of yeast in the bottom. And this is a large bottle, 750 milliliters, okay? There you go if you can find this. This is made by Lindemans. All right, it says down at the bottom. Let's pop the cap. Oh, man, I hadn't had this in so long. Forgot it's got a cork in it. Be right back. All right, we got it open now. And one of the unique things about this particular beer from Belgium is, uh, well, let me read the back of it. It'll, it'll explain it for you. Lindemann's Frambois is a lambic made from local barley, unmalted wheat, raspberry juice, aged hops, and wild airborne yeast. The brewer adds no yeast. Rich raspberry balance and wild yeast complexity. True lambics are brewed only in the Belgian's Seine River Valley, neighboring Brussels. I'm telling you folks, you can get some of this, check it out. It's really good and it's excellent over ice cream. Trust me on that one. And again, yeast is in the very bottom, so don't pour out the very last bit. Just, you know, pour it off top. Y'all check out that color. 
my word. And this this is a uh, it's a strong beer. It doesn't it doesn't have doesn't have how much uh, you know how strong the alcohol content is in it. Doesn't list it on the bottle. But my word, y'all check that out. It's got a nice head on it. Smells raspberry. I love this. Oh man, it's been a long time since I've had some of this. That bottle set me back about 13, 14 bucks here in the US. Man, that is good. Oh, so good. So again, thanks Richie for that question. And thanks Greg for answering that one. Manir Fernandez, let's see what you got for me, Manir. He says, uh, have you ever had in mind doing a suckling pig in the Weber Smoky Mountain? Yeah, in the Weber Smoky Mountain, in my Yoda Wichita, in the Kamado Joe, if it'll fit in there. Yeah, I definitely would like to do some type of a whole pig, whether it be a suckling pig or, or a larger one, you know, 70 pounder or whatever. But yeah, definitely want to do that. Second question, do you think of doing a brisket with butcher paper? Yeah, in fact, here in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be doing one. I've got some friends swinging by and uh, be a surprise for you. But yeah, we're going to be doing some wrap brisket on the Yoda Wichita. Should be a nice, nice uh, episode there for you. <clears throat> Let's see what else we got. Uh, Martin Flores. Martin says, if you were smoking a brisket, could you use wood for the first six hours and then rest, then the rest charcoal? Would it change the taste? He's just wondering how you can conserve some wood. Um, he says that meat can only, he's heard meat can only take so much smoke. Yeah, that's, that's right. He says he loves the chats. Thank you very much, Martin. I do appreciate it. You can definitely do that if you're trying to conserve wood. You know, start it off and let the meat get up to about 140, 145 internal. And then take it off and put it on your Weber Smoky Mountain or your uh, any other pit where it's just slow cooking, about the same temp that you had it on originally on the offset. But yeah, you can definitely do that, man. Um, I, I've done it before myself. It uh, it doesn't change the flavor or color too much. I mean, it it won't come out as dark and the bark won't be as crisp. It, but you know, that's just my own experience. But it'll it'll still be very very nice. You'll, you'll definitely enjoy it. So give that a try, man. I've, I've done it, and it worked out great. Let's see. Uh, oh, let's, let's, let, let's let Greg ask one. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, okay, this next question is from Tom's Barbecue Pit Stop, and Tom asks, have you ever th uh, thought about taking a barbecue class from a barbecue pit master like Myron Mixon, Tuffy Stone, or maybe Johnny Trigg to further your barbecue knowledge? I've had the opportunity twice taking both Myron Mixon and Harry Sue's class. Had a blast at both. Would love to do more one day. Um, if you did, what pitmaster class would you take and why? Um, Troy, I'd answer this question as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this. I've been to Johnny Trigg's two-day master class and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I loved it. Johnny Trigg, first of all, is just a world-class guy. His wife, really, really nice. Uh, ate some amazing food learned some of his little insider secrets. Also, it affirmed some of the things I was already doing, seeing you know, a person of his caliber doing some of the techniques that I've been doing. Um, I think anyone who really wants to master the craft of, of anything should take advantage of uh, watching the experts do what they do. And these guys that are out there in the mix, you know, they're making a career of outdoor cooking, of barbecue. They've done a lot of work to get to where they're at. And it, in my opinion, it's worth paying to soak in that knowledge. Um, that being said, you know, the classes that they give, it's more on competition cooking. Competition cooking is usually for one bite. You know, the judge is taking one bite of your food. So I know that I made some, a lot of adjustments to the flavor profiles uh, when I got home. I use a lot of their techniques, their cooking techniques, but as far as a lot of the flavor, levels of flavor, I toned it down because they're really packing it in there. But yeah, um, a buddy of mine went to Harry Sue's class and he shared all of the stuff he learned from Harry Sue. Um, another really good class, so. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been interested in doing stuff like that. Checking out the uh, different uh, barbecue masters, I guess you could say. I've never taken a barbecue class though. 
Sure would like to. I'd probably go with uh, Johnny Trigg. He's just a little bit up there towards the Dallas area, about four hour drive from me. So that'd be an easy one to get to for me. Definitely want to do that. Big Mo Quezon. I'd like to hang around him and see what he does, man. But that dude looks like he puts out some fantastic barbecue. So those would be my top two anyway. But yeah, man, that's a great question. And it looks like we got a couple of them here that are about the same topic, big green egg and stuff. And I don't have a big green egg, and that's why I don't talk about it. But let's let Greg answer. He's, he's got a big green egg. Take it away, Greg. Okay, Rick Hahn. I, hear you t uh, I don't hear you talk much about cooking on the big green egg. Uh, is there a reason? Also, I have been comparing the big green egg to the Gorilla Kong, um, but I only found videos from Gorilla Grills. Have you heard anything about the two? <clears throat> I own a big green egg and it's a great grill. That being said, you know, they're the first Kamado company to really make it big here in the US. So, you know, they're there, they're established, they've got the money. The one thing about big green egg is they haven't really been doing much to improve their design. They're, they're, it's pretty much the way it is when they first came out. And because of that, there are some up and comers like your Kamado Joes, your Primos that, you know, they're putting a lot of thought into their design features. And I own a Primo Oval XL. If I had to pick between one of the two, as far as the big green egg or the oval, I would take the Primo without a doubt. Um, again, big green eggs, a good cooker, but that, the Primo is just awesome. And the accessories it comes with, and I know, you know, Kamado Joe, again, I, I think one of these days they're going to just steamroll over Big Green Egg, my opinion. Um, now the Gorilla. I'm going to give you some food for thought. I don't own one, but I have noticed them. And I want you guys to notice this as well. Okay, this is the Gorilla Grill, the Kong. This is the Vision Classic Kamado. This is a Kamado made out of it, made in Asia, and it has no name, it has no brand, but they are very aggressively looking for American distributors to put their brand on it. If you notice these grills, these Thrill 3 cookers, they have the same features. Um, they're, I mean, in my opinion, they're almost identical. And that's something to think about. I mean, it, who knows, it may be a good thing. I, I don't know, I'm not gonna judge. I've cooked on a Vision, wasn't real impressed. Um, but my concern would be going with a company that is putting their brand on this, you know, Chinese made Kamado and they just, maybe they don't succeed, they go out of business. And where's your support at that point? What kind of support do these companies offer anyway? Um, but that would be my concern. The a company starting out, you're getting a really good deal on a, on a Kamado and then they go out. The other thing is there's a lot going on in a Kamado. I mean, it's, it's old technology, but there's a lot of modern technology that goes into the, making the new Kamados of the 21st century. And, you know, I don't, there's a lot of heat, man. If you're cooking pizza or something, you're, you've got some high temps. Fireboxes break, the cooker itself may break. What's the support you're gonna get? So my opinion, suggestion, my advice would be to pull back, take a nice calm look at the, the price you're going to pay for one of these less expensive cookers and make a decision. Can I wait a little while longer and then ultimately get a cooker that I know I'm going to be happy with? And that's what I would do. Again, your Kamado Joes, your Primos, Big Green Egg, get, get one of the big names that's been around. It's not, they're not going anywhere and you're gonna get the support that you're gonna want. Rashawn Sims. Have you seen these Gorilla Grills? Okay, I'm liking the price and the look of, of two of them. The Kong Grill looks nice for the garage and the Silverback looks like a plan for my backyard. Do you, have, do you know anyone who is using them? As I have heard that they're both only sold online, direct. Thanks again for your Q&A, Troy. Thank you, Troy. I think I've answered that question in the last, the last question. Um, again, just really really look into these before you buy one you know there's a lot of considerations and when you think about it you're paying three hundred dollars maybe more for a kamado joe 
Primo. In my opinion, it's, I'd rather pay more. That's just my opinion. I appreciate you putting those uh, pictures together of those Kamados, Greg. That was, that was a good good explanation, man. I really appreciate it. Let's see what else we've got here. Uh, Chevy 1121, 1947. What's your thinking on corp, corp uh, farm-raised animals as to free-range farming of them and the quality of the meat? Thanks. Um, I like to go free-range if I can, uh, especially with, like, chicken and stuff. I've always found that uh, the, the meat itself has better flavor, and it usually has less fat because the animals can usually, I mean, they're roaming usually a large plot of land, and so they're getting plenty of exercise. And the meat may, may be just a tad bit tougher because they are exercising more, but uh, I, I love the free range. That'd be my favorite. I'll buy free range any anytime I can get it, man. Um, do one more here. Christopher Brown. He's asking, uh, let's see, Troy, while listening to your answer of the weirdest things you've ever eaten, a smile rose on my face as you answered it, and the following question popped into my head. Where do frog legs rank among that list? Provided you've ever had the chance to have any, barbecued or otherwise. Oh, Chris, dude, man, I've got a frog leg video. It's fabulous. I, I put it up here for you. I love fried frog legs. In fact, I like frog legs better than chicken. That's how much I like them. Uh, they're kind of hard to come by, but uh, when I can find them, I'll pick them up, man. It's good stuff. Really, really good stuff. Greg, you got another question over there? Okay, Cristiano Mancini di Roma. I got a Charboil Deluxe Offset COS, cheap offset. Uh, what do you think would be the best mods for it? Any tips? I've never owned the Charboil, but I did own a New Bronzefels Black Diamond. Back in the day, they don't make them anymore. They no longer exist, but it was considered a COS. And I did a lot of mods to that. And I actually have an old video of the mods I did. Uh, that uh, Troy, you better post the link for this. Please don't judge me on this video. It is an old, old, old video. The production value is eh, minimal at best, but there are some good mods that, that uh, made for some very successful cooks. The biggest thing on these, uh, the cheaper uh, offsets is they're very thin, uh, kind of flimsy sheet metal, and you have huge issues with the lid sealing, and I addressed that in my, my video that I did a long time ago. Um, you don't get that heat saturation that you get with thick, you know, steel. And what I did with mine was I lined the bottom of the cooking chamber with um, fire brick like you'd have in a fireplace. I put in a baffle. I put in a diffusing plate or tuning plates. And I also, uh, on the inside of the lid, I brought the, the stack, the chimney, down very close to the to the cooking grate because that's a big problem with these the cheaper offsets is the hole for the chimney is right up there on the lid so this a lot of your heat just goes straight out of there rather than convecting around the uh, your meat so you know another thing you can do is buy like a <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> insulated blanket like they sell at the big box stores for water water heaters and drape that over your cooking chamber while you're doing your cook. <clears throat> Just an excuse for me to have another sip of beer. This is a Stone Mocha IPA. I've never had it. It's, it's really good, actually. Normally, I don't like the flavored beers, but this is good. But I'm a coffee drinker as well. Anyway, Christiana, I hope that helps. Watch my video. <laughs> Try. Make sure you watch this, my video. Yeah, Greg, I do remember that video. Man, that was, that was a long time ago. Back in the day. I don't like looking at my old ones either, but but that was a great video. I'll put it down in the description box for y'all. Again, hit show more. You can check out Greg's video showing you his mods that he did on his cheap offset. How about that? Let's see. We got another one here. Uh, Keith Vettag, my buddy Keith. Keith's a great friend of mine too up in uh, Evansville. Y'all go check him out. His channel down below in the description box. It says, hey Troy, at about the 1125 mark, you had a question about smoking aged beef before. And after you said it may be maybe a cold smoke before. Uh, yeah, I was talking about somebody had asked a question if you could cold smoke the beef before aging it, or would that hurt it? And I, I've never tried it, so I honestly don't know. I, I'm of the opinion that it it probably would work 
and maybe that's an experiment I'll do in the future. He says, all right, two things. When aging the meat, one is worried about contaminants. Yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, you don't want the bacteria and stuff on there. Would not smoke, would not the smoke contaminate the meat? Yeah, I see your point, Keith, and uh, you're right, man. It, it probably will, but I, I still think that that would be a great experiment to try one day. I, want, I really wonder how it would work, man. I have to put that on my to-do list. He says, also, after aging for, say, 45 days, and you remove the dried out part, would, not be, would that not be the same as you had cold smoked? Since cold smoking, I don't think the smoke would penetrate the meat that much. You know I ain't no expert in this. Your thoughts and my comments, your thoughts on my comments, please. Love you and drink up, buddy. Hey, cheers to you there, Keith. Yeah, uh, I think just to play it safe, I, I think that you're right, Keith. Age the meat first and then smoke it after the aging process finishes. Because the, the smoke particles, yeah, they could pick up some bacteria and stuff that's inside your pit or some, some moldy, you know, uh, uh, particles in the air. So uh, that, that very well could make, make the meat go bad, go rancid or whatever, you know. So you're probably right. Yeah, I think, I think that I would probably do an experiment just to see because that's an interesting experiment. But if I just didn't want to waste the meat, I would definitely age it prior to smoking it or grilling it. And, um, and then, you know, if, if you do smoke it, you can cold smoke it just to get some smoke on it. And then you can uh, vacuum seal it, put it in the freezer, and then when you're ready to eat it, pull it out, and then grill it. There you go. That's what I would do. All right, we got one here from Scott Parker. And just skimming through the question, he's asking about a, a Weber One Touch. And Scott, I, I personally don't have any experience on the Weber One Touch, the, the kettle-type grills from Weber. All I have is the Weber Smoky Mountain. But this is one that I think Greg can answer. He's got the One Touch. He's been using it on his videos quite often, in fact. So Greg, how about you take this question, man? Okay, next question comes from Scott Parker. Hi, Scott from the UK. I have a question that will probably be very basic for you guys over the pond. I have a Weber 57 centimeter one touch. I have been hooked on low and slow, but I am still struggling in achieving accurate temps, either too high or too low, plus not getting the bark. Do you have any tips for cooking on this barbecue? Also, would you get, uh, give a back to basics tutorial for us less talented pit wannabe masters in the UK? Really enjoy your vids, keep them coming. Try to make some more basic vids. I'm, I'm trying to make some too, Scott. So, first off, I've got a lot of experience cooking on a One Touch. I've owned One Touches, One Touches? I've owned them for years. I've, I've gone through several One Touch grills. I love them. They're uh, my go-to when it comes to grilling. I love grilling on the thing. Um, first thing I would do is get rid of those damn fire baskets that come with it, the little trays. In my opinion, they're a waste. I like to get the charcoal as far away from the meat as I can. And the way I do that is I simply get it right up against the inner wall of the kettle and I just kind of bring it around. Then just light one end or light the center of it and let it burn you know, like a wick or a snake, whatever you want to call it. The other thing is, is they actually sell some really good products nowadays for helping convert the, the Weber kettles to a more efficient kind of low and slow cooker. The one that I really like that I own is called the Gorilla Q. And basically what it is, it's a stainless steel reservoir that fits underneath your grate and you can actually divide the grate in half or you can push it uh, towards the heat side and actually give yourself more cooking space like in thirds. And it's filled with water and it creates a like a buffer between that intense heat and your food and you'd be amazed at the control you get using this Gorilla Q. There are other products out there, but I don't own them, so I'm not going to endorse them. I will endorse the Gorilla Q. Another thing you want to do is pick up a good temperature probe, something that you can monitor the temperature on the grate at food level, you know, like your Thermoworks or your Mavericks. The analog thermometer on the lid of the Weber will give you kind of an idea of where you're at, but I wouldn't want to trust in that you know it's just again it gives you an idea where you're at you want to know what the temperature is at food level so get a good thermometer 
I appreciate that, Greg. Thanks for that, man. That's, uh, that's some insightful info. All right, let me take one here. Mad Dog 8148. He says, T Roy, my man, I have to ask. I know you reference. You're from Louisiana, right? Yeah, I am from Louisiana. Grew up around Baton Rouge. He says, or are you from Texas? No, I, I live in Texas right now. I'm in Austin. And I got here, uh, let me see, I moved here about 1990. So I've been here 10, 20, you know, almost 30 years, 25 years or so. But, uh, man, I love it here. But I still have a lot of family in the Baton Rouge area. New Orleans, Baton Rouge, all that area. I do miss that food up there. And luckily I can get some of it here, some of the seasonings and stuff here in, in uh, Austin. But, yeah, like, uh, like I was mentioning in the last one, I think, uh, we go down to the Spring Fling at JB's. Uh, Louisiana Cajun recipes. Check the description box below. But uh, yeah, man, I, the crawfish bowls and stuff, I can do them out here, but it's not quite the same. The, the, the atmosphere is different when you're doing it with a bunch of coon asses and Cajuns down there. <laughs> good times, good times. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, let's see. We got one from Labunt. Um Talking about minion baskets for stick burners. Uh, he says, what do you think of these minion baskets for stick burners? They are 12 by 10 by 6 with charcoal separators. Burns kind of like a snake method. I really like these chats. Yeah, thanks. I pre appreciate that very much. Um, as far as the those snake method uh, minion basket things you're talking about with the dividers in there, uh, I can see where those may be useful if you're doing some cold smoking, like for some cheese or some salmon or something. But as far as cooking, like a barbecue cook with them, in my opinion, that, that wouldn't work. You got any opinions on that, Greg? I own a charcoal basket for my um, gator pit that I had made when I had my gator pit built. And for the gator pit, it's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. I don't use it anymore. It uh, never really provided enough heat to get that good heat saturation inside the cooking chamber. And uh, the other thing that it did was that big basket inside my firebox kind of obstructed my putting the large pieces of wood, you know, like the split logs of cooking wood in my firebox. So I don't use it anymore. I had a, a basket in my New Brunsfeld's Black Diamond and it, it helped. But if you got a big pit, you don't need it. I appreciate that, Greg. Thank you very much, man. Let's go with uh, Ray Max Kitchen and Grill, another YouTuber. Now check him out. Hit show more. Get to his link down below in the description box, folks. Uh, Ray, I appreciate the question there. He says, which family member motiv motivated you to cook or grill? That would have to be my grandmother, who is still alive at the, the ripe old age of 91. She's, she's still doing great, y'all. Love my grandma, Mama Jean. Love you, Mama Jean. And also my mom um, and my dad growing up. My mom did a lot of the baking and stuff, and, uh, and a lot of the cooking on the stove top and in the oven. But uh, barbecue-wise, my dad. My dad loved barbecue, and uh, we would grill every once in a while. Didn't really have a nice grill or anything, but we made do with what we had. So yeah, grandmother and uh, mom and dad. I appreciate the question, Ray. Let me see. Let's uh, let's let let's let Greg take this one right here. This this will be the last one. Uh, go ahead, Greg. What you got, man? Okay, this one comes from E. Hall. It says, have you ever tried tangerine smoking wood? Got some from a Japanese business associate but wanted your opinion on what to use it on. Actually, right over here over my shoulder, well, this way it's out of the camera view, I have a tangerine tree and I love using tangerine wood on fish. It's amazing on fish and also on poultry. But I'll sometimes throw just a little tangerine in with some pecan just to add a little light sweetness and it's great stuff. You got it, use it. Anyway, so I'm done. Troy, I appreciate you letting me crash your party. Um, hopefully I'll get to do it again. Hope you guys don't mind me answering the questions you had for Troy, but this was fun for me. So anyway, guys, I will, hopefully you're watching my videos. If so, I'll see you on my next video. <laughs> Cheers. That was great, Greg. Thank you very much, man. It sounds like I need to get some of that tangerine, tangerine wood from you, man. But that stuff is good. So uh, there you go. Uh, I can't thank Greg enough. Again, Ballistic Barbecue. Y'all go check out his channel. Check the description box or click the iCard up here. You can find him that way. 
So uh, thank you very much, Greg. It really means a lot that you did this with me, and uh, we'll have you back on if you uh, if you're up to it. You know, if you enjoyed this, and I think you did. These are really fun, man. Really good chats. And again, I appreciate all the suggestions, all the feedback, all the love you folks show me. I really do. I can't thank you enough. If y'all like this kind of stuff, continue giving me some feedback. Y'all keep asking some questions. Just ask your question in the comment down below. And um, yeah, we'll see y'all next Thursday. I gotta give a shout out to Sandra. Sandra's always um, talking really nice stuff about me. Sandra, God bless you, dear. Appreciate the support. And uh, everyone else out there, I hope y'all share this video. And when you do, please tell all your friends that T-Roy cooks responsibly. Cheers, everybody.